Amen. So we're starting out a brand new book tonight. We're going to be in the book of Deuteronomy. And if you know that book, you know that we're going to be in there uh, for a while, you know, going through it one chapter uh, every week. That's going to take us all the way into like June or July, somewhere in there, you know, depending. I uh, might try to sneak in a few more on Sunday nights just to kind of keep us moving along. But uh, it's a book in the Old Testament that I love. I really liked the book of Deuteronomy. I was reading through it and I thought, you know, was kind of looking for a book to preach through after we'd finished First and Second Timothy, and I thought this would be a great one. A lot of heavy stuff in there, a lot of stuff uh, you know that we have to kind of pick apart and study, but we should enjoy that kind of thing. You know, that's be why we're coming to church is to to learn the Word of God and learn the uh, the statutes and the judgments of the Lord. And Deuteronomy is full of that. And of course, uh, if we're familiar with the Old Testament, we know that this is coming about in the point of the story of the children of Israel, where. Uh, the previous generation that rebelled against the Lord has passed off, and now this is their children. Uh, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And Deuteronomy kind of starts out these first uh, 11 or 12 chapters, uh, just Moses really rehearsing everything that had taken place and reminding them uh, where they were and, uh, and where they had come from and, and also kind of warning them to not let these same things happen again. And we'll pick it up there in verse 1 where it says, These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel, <coughs> excuse me, on this side, Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab. These, uh, there are 11 days journeys from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. So <coughs> really what's kind of interesting right out of the, starting out of the gate is he's kind of telling them where they are in the story. He's telling us this is where they are. And they're in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran. And Paran, as we'll see here in a little bit later, is very close to the promised land. They're out in this, this desert area, this wilderness, about ready to pass over into the uh, promised land. So what's interesting though is verse two. Verse two just kind of has this random fact in there. It just kind of throws this out there where it says, there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. And I was reading that and I'm going, what, what's the point of this? He's just told us where they are and then he's just kind of giving us this measurement of it's, it's so far from here to there. Because they're not in Horeb, you know, and they're not in, they're near unto Kadesh Barnea, but they're not, that's not where they are, you know. And it's just interesting because I think what the Bible is showing us here, what God wants us to see, is that God is kind of, it kind of gives the context of this book but with this. It tells us where they are, right, in verse 1. This is, this is the story of where they are at this time. But verse 2 kind of reminds us where they could have been. Because if we'll see here in a minute, Hor uh, 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 Horeb is Mount Sinai. That is the, uh, uh, the Mount of God. And if you would uh, keep something there, turn over to uh, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. <coughs> Horeb is something that comes up quite often. Uh, it says there in Exodus chapter 3, it says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father and the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Of course, this is where God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And this is the same mount where we'll see in a minute that he later appeared in a pillar of fire and smoke with thunderings and quakings. Uh, go to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. So God's giving us these landmarks for a reason. You know, God doesn't just give us these ge geographical landmarks just because he's trying to take up space in the Bible. You know, he's not just put in there for filler. He wants us to notice something here. So you're going to Joshua chapter 14, and it says in Exodus 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall water come out of it. So this is a significant place. This is where God showed up in the burning bush. This is where he split the rock and gave them waters. This is also uh, where he came down in a pillow of fire. We'll see that. And look at Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. It says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh and the uh, Kenzanite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea, for which things I was uh, when I was uh, the Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to outspy the land and brought him word again as it was in mine heart. So we see that Horeb, first of all, that's where God appeared to Moses. And then you have Kadesh Barnea, which is where God was telling them to go over into the promised land. And of course, they failed at that in the first generation. And that's where he tells, uh, <clears throat> that's where he tells Caleb, you know, you will inherit this land. You know, he goes on and says, except for Caleb, 
you know, who was right in his heart, who, who wanted to go into the Caleb or go into the promised land. He said he's going to go in as well. And where did that happen? That happened in Kadesh Barnea. So these, these are two different places. This is where they are, Kadesh Barnea, in, you know, the plain, uh, in, in the, in, in, in the plain uh, between Paran and Tophel. And this is also, and then you have another place, which is Horeb, the Mount of God. Now look there in verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 1. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month. Now how long were they going to wander in the wilderness? 40 years, right? So God, I mean, 40 years is almost over. It's, it's 12 months in the calendar, right? And it's the 40th year in the 11th month on the first day of the month. So this is literally, you know, just weeks away from them crossing over in the promised land. And it just shows us that God, you know, he pays attention to detail. When he says 40 years, you know, he's not just shooting from the hip, you know, oh, about 40 years. He means 40 years. <laughs> like God is specific and he keeps track of things. So he shows that this is when this is all going down. This is when... Moses is giving these last words and <clears throat> you know that's why I really think I like this book because of course we know the ending it's where Moses dies and he's kind of this is his last great speech to these people rehearsing in their ears all the things that the Lord has done and reminding them of the things that the, the God expects of them and then passing off the scene and passing off the torch to Joshua but it's interesting to note that God got some you know he gets them right down to within a few weeks he says look this took place in the 40th year in the 11th month on the first day of the month and it took place here in, in Paran, you know, and in, 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 in he's giving us this measurement again about it being 11 days from Mount Horeb. And I believe he's telling us that because of God wants us to, wanted that to remind them of how close they really were. I mean, it, that, it was only 11 days. That first generation was 11 days away from passing over the, in, into the wilderness or passing out of the wilderness into the promised land. But because of their lack of faith, because of their unbelief and their disobedience, it went from 11 days to 40 years. Mm -hmm. So he's showing us you know, that sin has consequences. That if we disobey God, that if we, 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 you know, if we don't follow his commandments, that, that, that sin has consequences. And they can be drastic. You know, I'm sure when they disobeyed, they had no idea that they were going to end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And it's a shame. I mean, can you imagine wandering on 40 years knowing you were just 11, you know, you, were, you started out, it was 11 days journey. And you could have been there. Less than two weeks. So he's kind of giving us these times and these places to kind of, I think, show us some things about, you know, the consequences of sin and, and where they are in the story. And, and, of course, you know, giving it the context there. So they are in the wilderness and they're just days from crossing over into uh, Jordan. It says there in verse 4, after he had... Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 3. It says, And it came to pass in the fortieth year, in the eleventh month, in the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them, after he had slain Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, which dwelt at Azeroth and Edrei. Ed, Ed On this side Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, saying. So he goes into... Uh, you know what he you know this is begins the speech this is the context of what we have here so they're in the wilderness he begins the speech they're just days away from crossing the Jordan and uh, Moses begins by reminding them and warning them uh, by rehearsing the things that had taken place in the last 40 years so you got to remember this is the children of them that have passed off the scene I mean these people have been they've been waiting basically for their parents to die <laughs> you know it's kind of a you know, I don't want to say that lightheartedly, but it, it's the truth. I mean, they're out there wandering in the desert. They, you know, a lot of them are probably old enough to have heard the, the judgment that came down on them. And they knew that they were kind of just waiting for the last, gen that previous generation to pass off before they could go in. And Moses is taking the time to warn them, saying, don't forget about what your fathers did. Don't forget about how they failed and, and trying to remind them. So... He's saying, you know, he's reminding them, he's warning them, and then he begins, uh, he begins the story, of course, with them departing. He doesn't begin in Egypt. You know, he doesn't begin there. He begins in Mount Horeb, is where he begins to tell the story of the children of Israel. And he goes back, and he, and he says there in verse 6, And the Lord spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. So that's where the story begins, is in Mount Horeb, or what's called Horeb, or Mount Sinai, the Mount of God. Horeb is the place uh, where Mount Sinai is, and is referred to as either Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. And, you'll, you know, and I don't want to just throw that out there, so let's take a minute and look at it. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Only take heed to thyself, 
and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart of the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Verse 11, And they came near and stood under the mountain. And what was that mountain referred to? As Mount Horeb, right? Now, how does he describe this, this, uh, instant, this, uh, this event? And it says, And the mountain burned with fire under the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the, uh, of the words, but ye saw no militude, only ye heard a voice. So we see, of course, that's, if, you know, I won't take the time to go through it. I think I've made my point here. But if you go and uh, compare that to Exodus chapter 19, where that event takes place. In verse 16, it says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings. There was a thick cloud upon the mount, the, and there was a, uh, it was on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. I mean, it's the exact same event. There's no, deni there's no denying it. Right. You know, if it's not this one, then which one is it? When it was, where was the other instance where God came down in a pillar of fire and smoke? It's, it, this is it. And he calls it Mount Horeb. And uh, he says in Exodus chapter 13 that it's in the wilderness of Sinai. And this is where that mount is. So Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, the plains of Horeb, this is all the same place. This is the place where God came down in a pillar of fire and smoke. And you know, another place you could turn to if you wanted to further prove that would be 1 Kings 19. You don't have to go there. That's, of course, where Elijah, after defeating the prophets of Baal, he flees for his life and he goes to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. So that's what that's often referred to in Scripture as well. So that's where he begins the story, though. You know, he begins the story taking them back to where they first heard the law. You know, and that's really, I think, where God started to make them really accountable. He kind of introduces himself to them. You know, of course, they saw the miracles and everything, and they understood that it was God that was doing the working and that God was fighting uh, for them on their behalf against Egypt. But when he brings them over into Sinai and, and on the other side of the Red Sea and he comes down and starts to give them his commandments, that's really where God starts to make them accountable. You know, you've seen all my works. You've seen what I've done. You've seen that I'm fighting for you. And now here's how it's going to be between me and you. You're going to do this and this, and you're not going to do this and this. And he kind of makes them accountable at that point. And I think that's why Moses starts the story there, because that's, the, that's what he's trying to accomplish here. He's trying to remind them that they are accountable to God, that God has revealed them, uh, them to themselves by a, by, a, uh, by a stretched out arm and a mighty hand, and that has made them you know, accountable to him. So that's why I think he starts out there. Now, verse 7, it goes on and says, Turn you... And take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites and unto all the places nigh thereunto in the plains and the hills and in the vale and in the south by the, the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites and unto Lebanon and the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give unto them unto their seed after them. And I spake unto you that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord God hath multiplied you, and behold, you are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. So here we see where you know, he, God's telling him to go in, and then Moses is recalling the instance where he's saying, you know, we're going to look at it here, where he's, you know, he's judging the people from sun up to sundown. He's handling every single case that comes before him. And I think what we see here in this verse is just a great picture of what it's like to kind of be in ministry. You know, this is kind of a small, of course, it's on a, you know, a bigger scale. You know, we're talking about millions of people here. But this is some things that we could take away from and understand what it's like to be, you know, following God with a group of people, you know, and, and desiring to serve him. I mean, that's the same thing that we're doing. You know, it's called the church in the wilderness, these people, right, this group of people. Well, that's kind of what we are. You know, the, that church back then in Israel is a picture of us and of, you know, us as, as individuals, you know, living the Christian life and also as, as a church. And we see a glimpse of that, and really it, it makes sense that, there would be this parallel because in Moses' day, what's he dealing with? He's dealing with people. And in the New Testament church, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with the same thing, people. You know, and, and, and it's just a, and we need to understand something is that people in the Bible are just like we are. Right. You know, they're the, they're, there's no temptation taking you, but such as, common, as is common to man. You know, they are men of like passions. So it's not that people were just completely different back then and, and had this, you know, and, and it's just kind of this disconnect, I think, sometimes. You know, we living in our modern society, we kind of look back in the Bible and somehow we, we just get this disconnect by thinking that people behave differently or they had different reactions to things. It's not so. You know, there was still the same, you know, human experience back then as it is today. 
And uh, so I think this is just kind of a great picture of what it's like to kind of be part of a ministry, to be in a ministry. It's something that we just all need to kind of take note of because of the fact that if we're going to be involved in ministry, we're going to be dealing with people, with one another. And he said, uh, he said, so the Lord multiplied, multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. Now Moses isn't saying that as if it's a bad thing, right? You know, he's glad for that. Look there at verse 11. And he says, and, and look at the end of verse 11 before we read this. There's, this. there's a punctuation there, right? You know, the exclamation mark, right? This is something that's being exclaimed. This is something that's being said emphatically. And he said, the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are and bless you as he hath promised you. So Moses is glad that there's a lot of them. Moses wants even more. So, you know, take that to your, to your environmental meeting and, and your overpopulation crowd and, and tell them to deal with it because, you know, God is for multiplying, all right? And that's a whole other sermon. We're not going to go off on that. But it is worth noting that, that Moses here he doesn't have a bad attitude about it. He's not against big ministries, okay? There's nothing wrong with being part of a big church, Okay? Uh, there's nothing wrong with God's ministry growing. And people, and you say, well, we don't have that problem here. <laughs> well, maybe one day we will, you know. And there, by the way, there's nothing wrong with being part of a small church either. There's, get, there's pros and cons to each, you know. And me being in the position that I'm in, I, I, I'm getting a good feel of both. You know, I'm coming down here, but I'm also part of Phoenix. I've been there for a while. So I've seen kind of both sides. And you know what? There's pros and cons to both. And, uh, but what, I, what this is showing us is that there's nothing wrong with having a big ministry. Because some people, they have this attitude like they, you know, once a church gets to a certain size, they just can't be part of it anymore. Or, or the things are just aren't the same. Well, they're not the same, but that doesn't mean they're bad. It's just it's different, you know. And Moses here, he's all for it. He wants them to get big, but he also has a realistic view of what that means because he's experienced it. And he says in verse 12, How can I myself bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? Now, is Moses complaining here or is he just stating the facts? Moses is just stating the facts. Because this is the facts that when you're dealing with people, we all have the potential and the ability to, you know, be a cumbrance, to be a burden, and to create strife. This happens in ministries. So Moses, you know, he desires the blessing of a multitude, but he also understands with that with that multitude, there comes difficulties. And that's what we need to understand as well. That as a church grows, as it gets bigger, there are going to be difficulties. You know, and these, he names three specific things, doesn't he, that could be uh, a, a, a difficulty you know, in dealing with people. And one of them, you know, he says, cumbrance. How can I bear your cumbrance? Now, that's kind of a, you know, a different word. You, know, you might think of a cucumber. It has nothing to do with it, right? Because of the fact it just spelled it. We, that's not a word we use a lot, right? It's not referring to a vegetable, okay? He's referring to trouble or bother or worry or carefulness. That's what that means, cumbrance, okay? You know, and a good uh, way to kind of get an idea of what this word means is, you don't have to turn there, but I'll remind you of the story of Martha and Mary, right? When, when one was cumbered about with much serving, right? In Luke 10, verse 40, it says, Martha was cumbered about with much serving. What does it mean by she was cumbered? Well, if you read on, Jesus in verse 41 says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. So she was cumbered. What did that mean? That she was careful and troubled. So that's what it means to be a, a cumbrance. You're someone who's very troubled. You're somebody who's bothered. You are worried. You have carefulness. You know, and that's part of ministry. People have concerns. People worry. People have troubles in their life. You know, and if we just want to be a part of ministry where just nobody has any trouble, when nobody has any worries, when nobody has any carefulness in their life, well, you know, good luck finding that church because that's, that's just life. You know, people go through life and they have troubles. They are encumbrance from time to time. And uh, so people have issues, basically, is what I'm trying to say. You know, and people have baggage and people have issues and, and, and some, you know, whether it's, it's justified or not, it's there. You know, in some instances, a lot of times, you know, people worry about things justifiably, understandably so. You know, they go through life, they go through difficult things, and uh, they're worried about things, you know. And, uh, and we, so we have to understand that's what kind of comes with the territory when you're starting to deal with people. And you ha the more people you have, the more of this you have. You have more cumbrance. He says, how can I bear your cumbrance and your burden, right? So what is burden? Well, that means something that is born with difficulty, something, you know, you think of putting a heavy burden on your back, you know, and, and carrying it. 
Uh, another good example uh, to define this would be Exodus 23, where God's commanding and saying, If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden, he's talking about an animal that has collapsed under uh, the weight of the load it's carrying. He said, uh, And wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help him. All right, so that's what it means to be under a burden. And he's saying, Look, you guys are a burden. People have burdens in life. You know, people have come in and they have burdens. Sometimes they themselves are a burden to others. But we don't write them off, you know. We don't we don't just say, well, you know, it's unimportant to us. You know, we need to bear one another's burdens. Is what the Bible says. So people have issues, people have difficulties, and uh, you know, they 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 can be a burden at times. You know, it's interesting to there that he says, hey, how can I bear your burden? You know, it's not that they only had one burden. He's kind of referring to them as a burden. You know, and you know that's not necessarily said in a bad way. You know, that's, there is a burden in the ministry. When you have people coming, you know, there is a weight of responsibility that is put on leadership to make sure that, you know, those, they're being looked at, people are being looked after and taken care of spiritually. That is a burden, a spiritual burden. Mm -hmm. And it was something that Moses felt. He, and that's why he said, your burden, not burdens. So he says, you know, your burden. He goes on and says, uh, your strife, right? And what is strife? Well, strife would be vigorous or bitter conflict. Right, and you know it just goes to show that sometimes people can cause trouble in churches, and that just kind of comes with the territory. You know, nobody's perfect, and and that kind of thing comes up from time to time. And uh, so he's saying here, and he's showing us all these things, and he's saying, look, you know, I want you to multiply, I want you to grow. God bless you, and many, th you know, make you a thousand times more so as the stars of heaven. And then he's, but he's kind of reminding them at the same time where, where he said, you know. At this point, he said, how can I bear myself? How could I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? There's a reality that comes with the ministry. And he is, uh, you know, he is uh, basically just expressing the way it is. You know, he's not, he's not saying in a bad way or a negative way. And, you know, it's worth taking note of. It's worth taking the time to mention this and bring it up and preach about it because of the fact that, you know, we're admonished to do the same thing in the New Testament. You say, why are we in Deuteronomy? How is that going to help us? Well, this is pretty applicable when you think about it. Because again, it's people. It's dealing with people then. That's what we're dealing with today. And, you know, we are admonished in the New Testament to act accordingly. Understanding that people come in with burdens, that people come in and there's strife, that people come in and there's cumbrance, that people have cares. These things happen in a ministry. And we have to act accordingly. Not just as leaners, but also as people in the pew uh, when we're rubbing shoulders with one another. The Bible says in Colossians 3, I'll read to you. It says in verse 12, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now these are the kind of attributes we should all be striving to have in our life. Because we're always going to be dealing, if we're going to stay in the ministry whether uh, you know, it's just serving in the, in, out of the pew or behind the pulpit or whatever capacity uh, we serve in, you know, you're going to be serving people. You know, you're going to be out there knocking doors. You're going to run into people with cumbrance. You're going to run into people with strife. You're going to run into people with these, these things. And the Bible is telling us that, look, if you're going to serve God and deal with people, that you need to have humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these, put on charity, which is the bond of per perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. So why does that matter? Why should I stop even and point that out there in the Deuteronomy? Because it's 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 because of the fact that we're dealing with people, and we're admonished to have you know these attributes in Colossians uh, in or, when we're dealing with people. I mean, what, I mean, it says there that they are to put on humbleness of mind and meekness. And what was, what's Moses' title? The meekest man on the earth. Why was Moses selected and used of God in such a mighty way? Because he had these attributes in Colossians chapter 3. And those are what's necessary to lead a people or to deal with people. Because people have these problems. And we all do. So, <coughs> and really, just kind of moving on here. You know, one thing we need to also understand from this is that, you know, Moses is, of course, expressing the fact that, you know, there's a lot of them at this time in the story. You know, they're being told to leave Mount Horeb and go up into the Promised Land. And he just kind of abruptly says, 
You know, and I spake unto you at that time, you know, remember when we were leaving Horeb and we were told to go, and I spake to you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you uh, myself alone. You know, there was this great work that had to be done, right? They had to leave Horeb, they had to go up, and they had to conquer the promised land. And Moses is saying, hey, I can't do this. How can I do this myself alone? And uh, <coughs> what we need to understand from that is that leadership Okay, and a church cannot cease to accomplish spiritual goals because of human hindrances. Let me say that again because it's kind of wordy. Leadership cannot cease to accomplish spiritual goals because of human hindrances. You, you know, Moses couldn't let these things, the cumbrance and the burdens and the strife stop him from accomplishing the goal that God had for his people. That had to happen. And Moses, is, as a leader, that was his primary goal. Not to say that he didn't care about all these other issues. That he didn't care about helping people in these areas. But he had an ultimate spiritual goal of going into the promised land and, and doing what God wanted them to do. And he recognized something very quickly. Is that, you know, he, and Moses had to learn this for himself. And if you would, go to, over to Exodus chapter 18. And, and that, that he could not let these things stop him from accomplishing God's goals. That's what he had to learn. Look there in Exodus chapter 18, verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from morning until the evening. You know, you think getting uh, the, the seeing a, a full inbox in the church emails, you know, or when I go check the Google Voice and it's just like, brrr, you know, man, got to answer all these, got to listen to all these. Well, you know, at least I wasn't there. It's not going to be from morning until the evening listening to every single person come and, you know, and, and say, I've got this problem, I've got this problem, you need to fix this, you need to deal with that, what do I do here, can you give me advice? And it's just, but that's the reality of the ministry. And Moses, you know, he's sitting here from morning until evening, and when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? So what he's saying here, he's kind of expressing like, what are, you know, what are you doing? You know, this is Jethro. He's saying, this isn't good. And, and what it's showing us is that it, it was inefficient to have one man bear the whole burden. It was inefficient to have one man sit there and judge every man's cause. And he goes on in verse 15, And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God, when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them to know the statutes of God and his laws. So he's basically like breaking down and explaining the Bible to them, you know, in every one of these instances. So, I mean, that can be, that can be, that can wear a guy out, you know, having to sit there and, and, and explain the Bible in this situation, what you need to do in this situation, in this situation, from morning until evening. You know, that's, that's a lot of work. And, and Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that thou doest is not good. And you know what? He's right. It wasn't good. It wasn't good for Moses, and it wasn't good for the people. Because what happens, you know, he goes on and he says there, Thou shalt will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. He says, if you keep doing this, Moses, if you this is the way you're going to try and do things, you're going to wear away and this people. Because here's the thing, if they're relying on Moses alone and Moses wears away, where else, where are they else are they going to go? They got nobody. Right? So it doesn't benefit Moses, and it doesn't benefit the people to just have one guy doing everything. He said, For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. So in that kind of thing, Moses had to learn here that, you know, in, he had to learn that nobody benefits from this kind of, of, of ministering, where it's just one guy, you know, just trying to do everything. And what it shows us is that leadership, you know, in order to accomplish the task that God has given, you know, it can't stop, be stopped by these human hindrances, these things that come up that are just part of the ministry, that are just, you know, natural, they're just natural parts of ministry because we're dealing with people that they cannot, uh, they, can't, they can't do all of it on their own. That leadership relies on others in order to accomplish the mission. You know, he, he needed help, right? So this required, but what does that, what does that mean to us? That if there's a, you know, like for example, the, the preacher, Pastor Anderson, you know, the church has grown, we got a satellite church, you know, trying to do these works, trying to accomplish God's task, you know, of, of reaching, the, of preaching the gospel to every creature, you know, he's going to need help. You know, he's going to need people to step up and, and to fill roles and to, and to help in the ministry so that he himself does not wear away. Right. But what does that mean to us? 
What it means is that it requires some of us to be spiritual. Amen. If we're going to accomplish this great goal, you know, other people are going to have to grow spiritually. You know, they're going to have to, you know, man up, yeah. for lack of a better term. They have to step up to the plate and, and fulfill that role. I mean, Moses, we'll see here in a minute, he had to turn to other people, right? And that required other people being spiritual and growing in the Lord. So he says there in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, Moreover, thou shalt provide out... This is the solution, right? Jethro, I like him. He wasn't just a guy who complained about things. He had, he had a solution, right? He, wasn't, he, he saw a problem and he had a solution. And that's the way we ought to be. Not just have, see a problem and say, oh, there's a problem here. What are you going to do about it? You know? And, but actually have a solution. Anyway, that's, that's, that, that's a whole sermon right there, right? So he says in verse 21, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So it shall be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. That's what, you know, ministries that get big, and as they grow, that's what they need. People that are going to bear the burden with the leader. And uh, that requires them to be these type of guys, men of truth. You know, know the Bible, understand the truth, believe the Bible, practice the Bible, live the Bible. Hating covetousness. You know, they're not in it to try and, and get fame and glory or money or whatever, what have you. And those are the people that are going to be placed over them. And of course, he breaks it down real practically. He gives them numbers, right? And he says, look, you're going to have rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, and rulers of tens. So there's kind of like a hierarchy there uh, in every... If this matter was too hard for the ruler of ten, then it goes to the ruler of hundreds. And if that guy can't figure out, then it goes to the thousands. And if that guy can't figure out, you know, and the, the thought being that, you know, somebody somewhere along the line is going to be able to figure this thing out before Moses has to stop what he's doing and deal with it. But not to say that there wouldn't be those instances where there are some things that are just, you know, you know, we haven't experienced, we haven't gone through, we don't know the answer, that we go to the next person and it could go all the way up the chain. But what it shows us is that you know, the ministry isn't a one-man show. You know, people kind of get this idea that it's all about just the guy behind the pulpit. But that's not what ministry is. Ministry is not a one-man show. You know, it requires a multitude of people doing the work of God. You know, this is just one small part of what we do as a ministry. You know, we're not just all about the preaching. Now, the preaching is important. It's got to take place. We've got to admonish one another. We've got to build each other up. We've got to, you know, help each other grow. But, you know, there's a lot of other things that go on. You know, the preaching that goes on door to door, knocking the doors, the song leading, the Bible reading, all these other things, and, and other things that can be added unto it. I mean, there's more that this ministry could do other than even what we're doing now. You know, there's other things that we could uh, try uh, getting involved in, and, 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 and all to the same goal, of course, all to the same end of trying to preach the gospel. You know, I've got things in mind that I even want to do, you know, like starting a, a truck stop ministry. I keep telling myself I've got to get on that. You know, we've talked about the nursing home ministries getting started, but, you know, that requires able men. That requires other people. That's not something that just one man does. So, <coughs> it shows us that it's a, not a one-man show. And, you know, it, and, and it shows us that there's kind of, there should be a pattern of how things are kind of dealt with. That, you know, it's not, we should, not every issue has to be brought to Pastor Anderson. You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, we as a body here, that maybe could bring to a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, and, and, and get advice and help right there from a, a more experienced Christian, you know, someone who's gone through some things, and you know, we could get advice right there. You know, uh, that that would we could probably find an answer to some of our problems in that regard. You know, if there's something else that you know you'd have to bring to myself, maybe you know, as the deacon, and say, hey, what do you think about this? Can I get your advice here? That's that's part of what I'm here for. You know, maybe if there came something up that was so difficult and so hard to to understand, then we'd say, hey, well, let's talk to Pastor Anderson about it, you know, and get his mind on it. But, you know, we should be able to solve things in-house. You know, we should be able to solve things in our own lives, if, if possible. And not just be the type of people that just every little thing, we, got to ha we have to know what the pastor thinks about this, and what the pastor thinks about that, or what the man of God thinks about this. I mean, we have the same Holy Spirit, we have the same book that, that any man of God has, and there's a lot of things that if we would just be spiritual and get into it for ourselves and be faithful in reading it and understanding it and knowing it, that we could probably resolve on our own or resolve, you know, with a brother in Christ or sister in Christ. And, you know, and the Bible, 
kind of even says that if a church can't do that, it's kind of a shame. Because it kind of shows the church to not be very spiritual. If a church can't handle its own problems and kind of deal with things amongst themselves, and I'm not saying, you know, if you ever have to come to some, somebody for help, you know, of course that's not a shame, but th it could turn into where it's just like every little thing, you know, it has to be Pastor Anderson has to handle this. And some people have that kind of men mentality, you know. And if you listen to last night's sermon that he preached, you know, you, he kind of talked about this. And I, it was kind of great because it kind of tied in with what, what I was going to be preaching about. And it kind of gave me some ideas. But, you know, some people have that mentality where it has to be Pastor Anderson that's going to handle this. And they call the church all the time. <laughs> you know what? Here's the thing. I call these people back. They seem sincere. They leave a voicemail. Hey, I've got a question about the Bible. And, uh, you know, I'd really appreciate it if Pastor And I'll call them back and say, hey, Pastor's not available. But, you know, I'm the deacon here. I can, well, can I help you? Oh, I was really hoping he would, he would call. I'm like, well, well, I mean, if I gave you the same answer he's going to, then what does it matter? And you know, what it really is, a lot of them they just they just got to talk to Pastor Anders, and they're just they'll they'll they're trying to bait us, you know, like they just want to get him on the phone. They're like, I've got this deep spiritual question, this real complex problem. They want to get him on the phone and start talking about I don't know what some weird thing. You know, there's so much weird stuff out there now. That that happens though. They 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 do that all the time. And, you know, and, and it's, I have to watch myself because I don't want to get, you know, jaded and be like, well, every guy that calls with a question is just some bozo. <laughs> and just start hitting delete, 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 delete. You know, I have to stop myself and say, wait, you know, there's probably still going to be some, some people here that have a sincere problem that would appreciate a call from me. Right. You know, or anybody in the church. You know, they just need somebody to talk to them and help them through some situation. I've called people back and had great conversations and helped them in that way and and, and amen for that. So those things kind of come up, but I'm just, you know, this kind of a warning that we, we don't want to be like that as a body, as a church. Where just, you know, Pastor, my shoelace is untied. What do I do? You know, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bend over. You know, I want you to take the, make the loop, have the rabbit go around the tree and through the hole, make some bunny ears or something like that, you know, however they do it. So, <clears throat> and the Bible does say if a church can't, judge within itself that it's a shame to them. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren. So, you know, we should be able to judge amongst ourselves and, and resolve issues without having to bring every little thing to leadership. So, uh, let me just move on here. It says there in verse 13, because we got a you know, big chapter here, and I've considered maybe even how to breaking these chapters up in, in parts 1 and 2. I don't want to feel like I have to rush through these things, but we'll get through here in verse 13. It says, uh, Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers uh, uh, over you. So this is again, you know, back in uh, Exodus where, or excuse me, Deuteronomy, where we're picking back up, and he's telling them, uh, you know, this is what I said to you. And he, and he answered me and said, The thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. And I charged you, and I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with him. So, you know, that's a big theme in the Bible, and we'll get into this more later. But that the, as the you know the one law for the for the the, the homeborn and the stranger, Amen. you know that's what the Bible teaches, and that's a, another sermon. But he said, "Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring unto me, and I will hear it." So if it is genuinely too hard for you, then yeah, bring it to him. He's saying, and I command you at that time uh, all things which ye should do. So. Again, he kind of just kind of sums it up there. And I commanded you at that time all things that you should do. So, you know, he's just kind of giving them a synopsis here, or synopsis, excuse me. And, and he's, you know, the specifics, you know, have been covered already, right? And here's the thing about this. I don't want to dive into all what was just said because the fact that these specifics are discussed again later in Deuteronomy. You know, verses 1 through 11 are kind of him just reminding and warning Israel of what has taken place. And then when you get into chapters 12 and onward, that's where he kind of picks up the statutes and the judgments of the Lord and starts rehearsing them. You know, and basically repeating the things that he said to the previous generation. So we'll dive into that when we get to it. But he says in verse 19, And when you departed from Horeb, we went through all that great uh, terrible wilderness which you saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord your, our God commanded us. 
And we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said unto you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God uh, set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord the God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. And he came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they will go search out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities uh, we shall come. So it's interesting here because if you would go to Numbers chapter 13, okay? So he's saying, look, we came up into the land of the Amorites. You know, this is them coming to the you know, brink of River Jordan. They're ready to pass over the promised land. And he says, uh, and he says to them, and ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said. So he's saying, look, you guys came to me and said, they came to him and said, we will send men before us. You know, the he's talking about the 12 spies, right? So here it sounds like, what well, was their idea. They're the ones that came up with this idea of sending in the 12, right? But what does it say in Numbers chapter for th verse 13? Let's see whose idea this really was. It says in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, ye shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. So again, referring to the 12 tribes. So, in Deuteronomy, I'm saying, ye came to me and said, we will send men. And then you read in Numbers where the Lord commands Moses to send men, right? So whose idea was it? I don't know. It sounds to me like it was the Lord's, right? But why does it phrase it that way in Deuteronomy? Why does it say that he came to them? Well, you know, I don't know that I really have the answer to that, but I have some thoughts, okay? So verse 22, you know, in, in, in Deuteronomy, it might be just saying that, you know, they were in agreement with what the Lord had commanded, you know? Or it could be that God knew that that's what they were going to do anyway, and God commanded Moses you know, uh, preemptively. You know, it also might be uh, an example of uh, the Bible recording what somebody said and what actually happened, right? This could be an example of Moses said, "Oh yeah, remember you guys came to me," you know, and, and that would kind, of, but that would kind of insinuate that Moses isn't recalling the story correctly, which so I really don't go with that. You know, I, I think it might be that God just understood the people would want this and he approved it ahead of time. Because he already knew it was going to happen. God knows the beginning from the end. And in spite of knowing the outcome of them not just going out by faith and going to the promised land, that they knew they were going to come and make this request to have these spies sent in. And he knew what that was going to lead to. You know, he might have even known that Moses would object to it and see the potential danger in it. I don't, this is all me just hypothesizing. Yeah, but I think that's probably, that's kind of what I go with, is that God already knew that they were going to come make this request, so he just kind of ahead of time says, look, do this. You know, and so when the people come, it's just kind of, you know, they already, they were all on the same page. But it could be an example of, you know, and I don't think it is, but it's just worth bringing up that whenever we're reading the Bible, we have to make sure, you know, especially if we think there's some kind of contradiction, one of the first things you need to figure out is whether or not the Bible is telling you something that was said or commanded, or something that just happened. And there's many instances of this in the Bible. You know, one that I've heard even recently that I've, I've come up with and even wondered about myself was in Ezra, where, where they, put, they divorced their strange wives and put them away. But the Bible says God would never command that, that he didn't command that. Yeah, but the Bible doesn't say that God commanded them to do that. It just says that's what they did. So and there's a lot of things like that in the Scripture where the Bible just tells you, hey, this is what they did. Like, you know, uh, polygamy is a great example of that, where they, they would multiply wives to them. God never, and God specifically said thou, not for them not to multiply wives. You know, it should be one man and one woman. But he gave clauses for when that did happen, do this and that. So keep that in mind. I don't think that's what this is going on here, what's going on here with this passage. I think this is just God un kind of understanding what the people are going to want anyway, and just going ahead and doing it. <coughs> and the Bible says in verse 23, And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went up into the mountain, and came to the valley of Eshcol, and searched it out, and they found the fruit of the land in their in, in, the fruit of the land in their hands, and brought it down unto us, and brought us word again, and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, you would not go up or rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And he murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, and hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us in the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. So this is just one of the most dis disappointing stories in all of Scripture. 
I mean, they go, I mean, it, you just can't even fathom how a group of people could be so ignorant and stubborn and, and lack such faith after everything they'd gone through. You know, it just blows your mind that they would go, they would be delivered out of Egypt the way they were with miracles, the plagues, the, the miracle of plagues, and then, you know, crossing the Red Sea, just huge miracles, seeing the pillar of fire and smoke and thunderings and quakings and the voice of God and the trumpets. You know, but even then, when all that was going on, they, Moses comes back and they're worshiping a calf. Yeah, right. yeah. And you just you can't understand these people. But that's human nature. And uh, you know, it shows us something about that you know, we're just, you know, as human beings, we are, at times, can be you know, faithless, stiff-necked, stubborn, rebellious, even in the, the presence of God himself. And, you know, that's kind of what's going on here. They're going into the land. They're seeing all the fruit. Oh, it's a good land the Lord doth give, doth give us. But, you know, there's these, gra there's these uh, not grass, there's these, these giants there. We're grasshoppers in their sight. We can't go in. You know, they, they have chariots of iron. You know, it's just not possible. You know, you get the, the 12 tribes. Ten had the bad report and two had the good. And what happens is that Israel went and it says, and they murmured in their tents. And it should show you something else, you know, that just because, you know, you're, you're not doing it in public, God still hears it. Yeah, right. You know, God hears it when you get in the car. I can't believe the preacher's in there. <laughs> Gee, I don't appreciate that. You know, God hears that when you're murmuring. We read something in the Bible, we put it down. I can't believe God would ever. God notices all that. You know, people think that just, these guys thought, well, if I get behind some canvas or whatever, that somehow God can't see through that. But he did. And, you know, and, and it's a lack of faith on their part. And what did it lead to? It lead to a, a serious false accusation. To where they're, they're saying, God brought us out to kill us. Oh, God hates us. He's here. He brought us out just to kill us. I mean, if that were the case, that would make God just the, the, the cruelest person in the world. Like, just, just think how cruel that would that'd be. It'd be like torturing a bug or something. Well, I'm just going to bring him out and just to kill him. Just for my own sick amusement. That's what they're saying about him. Oh, he just brought us out because he hates us and he wants to kill us. And you know, it would be better if we were back in Egypt. And so this lack of faith leads to a false accusation of the worst kind. It says in verse 28, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, uh, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities and the great are walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there, which were the giants. Now, you know, it's not an excuse for them. You know, they shouldn't have allowed this to happen. But the fact is, the Bible does say their brethren have discouraged their hearts. You know, and, and that is what happened. That's not an excuse. It doesn't excuse them from being a faithless generation. But it does show us something. That our attitudes and our actions, they have an effect on others. That we can discourage one another. We can be an encouragement or a discouragement to one another. So, that's all I got to say about that. Because we got to move on. But that is something worth noting, isn't it? I mean, that's what happened here. Not an excuse, but that is what happened. Then he says in verse 29, Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. He's trying to remind him, remember what he saw in Egypt? And in the wilderness where thou hast, uh, hast seen the Lord thy God, uh, doth bear thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that ye went until ye came unto this place. He's saying, God has been providing for you and taking care of you. He's done miracles in your half. Don't be afraid. And but we know the result, that that wasn't enough for them. And I love the analogy that he uses here to try to express this to them. He says, as a man bears his son. And that's just a great way of Moses expressing that God's attitudes towards them. You know, because that's a, that's a very uh, close relationship. That's a very loving and caring and nurturing relationship. A man towards his child, a man towards his son, right? And, but, you know, it, it also has more layers to it than that. Just a man protecting and, and providing over his family and his children, his son. You know, a father also has a certain role for his, his, his children as well. What does he do? He instructs them, right? And that's what God was doing with them, instructing them. As a man doth his son. He commands them, right? <coughs> if we're fathers, you know, we're ruling our house as well. We, are, we command our children, you know, be quiet, <laughs> Or whatever it is. Pick that up. Put that away. You know, behave yourself. Don't look at your mother like that. Don't talk to your mother like that. And all these things that we command, right? And a lot of things, you know, trying to guide them and lead them in, in the way they ought to go. We punish them, you know. The Bible says, you know, spare not the rod. 
that we are to beat and, and to instruct. And part of that is, you know, corporal punishment. You know, and, and applying the, the rod of instruction to the seat of learning, right? And we are to, to, to punish when they do wrong and to care for them as well. So I just love the analogy he uses there where he's trying to encourage them to go in, to not be doubt, to not to doubt, to not be faithless, to say, look, God cares for you like a man cares for his son. And uh, <coughs> it goes to show us also that being a child of God is a double-edged sword. You know, just like a son, if you have a, da a good dad, that's a double-edged sword. You, if you're on dad's good side, you know, things can go very well. If we misbehave, if we get out of line, you know, dad's going to do his duty as well. And uh, <laughs> that's really what it kind of comes down to in the Christian life. If, you know, as God's child, do you want to be blessed or do we want to be chastened of God? So uh, just moving along here, verse 32, it says, Yet in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search you out of place, to put your, uh, your tents in, in a fire by night, to show you by what way you should go, and in a cloud by day. Now that didn't, if you recall the story, that wasn't just a one-time event. That happened the entire time. Right. It was a fire by night every night. It was a cloud by day every day. They had this constant witness before them of God's presence, and yet still were un unbelieving. And the Bible says in verse 34, And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth. You know, God cares about what comes out of our mouth. God cares about our attitude towards him and our situations. And he swears, saying, uh, and he goes on in verse 35, but, you know, before we get there, you know, I want to focus on that where he says that the Lord heard your voice. You know, that should be a warning to us. And you know, I kind of talked about it earlier with, you know, you heard your murmuring in the tents. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. You know, we should be careful about the things that we say, and, and how we say them, and our attitude, really, because, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And really, what it, you know, when we get to the, you know, the, the core of the matter, it's, it's the heart, it, is the heart of the matter. It, 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 you know, the words that we say are just, projecting of, of what we feel inwardly so you know we should not forget that and we should always remember that god like a father knows you know pays attention not to just the things we do but also even attitudes even even you know even even the words that we say now verse 35 you know i'll move along here for sake of time it says surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which i swear unto give your fathers save caleb the son of jephunneh he shall see it and to him will i give the land uh, that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. And if you recall the story, Joshua was the other one that received the same promise. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou shalt not go in hither. So he's angry at Moses too. And why was he angry at Moses? Because remember the second time, he told him to not smite the rock, but to speak to it. And Moses was wroth, and he hit the rock, and then he hit it again, right? And finally the rock broke, and, and, and water came forth. But... Um, but, but, and that was supposed to be a picture of Christ and that upset God that, you know, and so even Moses, you know, he was, he was punished to some degree. He was not allowed to go in. And also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, thou shalt not go in thither. Now it's interesting there. I, I, I didn't really come up with any thoughts, but I kind of dwelt upon it. I really couldn't get anything, but, you know, and I, I wanted to kind of talk to, you know, uh, some other people about this and then I didn't have the time, but he says that the ang Lord was angry with me for your sakes. Now, to me, it seems like Moses is kind of maybe blame shifting a little bit. Like he's saying, like, it's not really my fault, you know, you know it's because of you. Or maybe he's like, taking responsibility, but he is saying, look, you know, if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't have gotten upset and I wouldn't have done what I did. You know, and he's saying, look, the Lord was angry with me for your sake because of what you did. You made me mad and now I'm in hot water with God, too. And he says, thou shalt not go in thither. You know, and that is such a disappointment. To, to read that. And, and then as the story goes on in Deuteronomy, we'll see that where Moses even again kind of says, hey, do you think maybe I could go in? Yeah. And God says, don't speak to me no more of this matter. You know, this was a real source of disappointment for, for Moses. And, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I mean, think about that. I mean, being the guy that led the children of Israel and was not faithless, you know, that did not doubt God, but having to stay back with those same people who were faithless. What a disappointment that must have been to him. And he goes on, he says, uh, in verse 40, But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, which ye said shall be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, 
They shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. So that's the generation that we're dealing with now. Those little children have grown up. The 40 years have passed. They're now into adulthood. You know, they were not being held accountable for the sins of their parents. They had, as it says there, they had no knowledge of good and evil. They didn't know what was going on. You know, they were innocent in this. But, uh, you know, he, he's, he's just saying they're going to be the ones that go in and possess it, not you guys. And this is the punishment. Then he answered me. No, he goes on and says in verse 40, But as for you, turn you and take your journey in the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So, and then, they, and then they answered, said unto him, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all the Lord our God hath commanded us. And when he girded on every man his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mount uh, or into the hill. So, you know, it, it's just crazy. Like, they are so doubt, that so, you know, faithless. They were, you know, rebellious and stiff necked. But as soon as God says, okay, fine, you're not going in. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll go in. Yep. You know? And it just goes to show you, you know, sometimes you don't know what you have until it's gone. Yep. You know? And they, they didn't realize the opportunity that they had until God says, oh, okay, we'll have it your way then. And, 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 and now it's gone. You know, it reminds me of, you know, my kids. They start arguing over a toy or something like that. So you're going to get along with that toy, over that toy, or I'm going to take it away from you. And now no one's going to play with the toy. And it's amazing how quickly they figure out how to get along in playing with those toys. Right. Because they realize they have an opportunity before them to enjoy, you know, the, the toys. But if they don't, it's gone. It's kind of the same thing here. You know, they're, they ha they, they're, they're taking this for granted. You know, they just let their attitude get out of control. And then God has to come down on them. They're like, oh, no, no, we're sorry. Well, it's too late. You know, what happens if you, you know, you say that now, but what if what, we get over in the promised land and you have that same attitude? And now God's going to have to just, you know, keep, you know, you get to Jericho. Oh, we can't believe it. No, we can't do it. Why'd you bring us out here? You know, the first city, you know, God's going to have to keep dealing with these people over and over again because this is who they were. You know, this is just was ingrained in them. So God takes it away from them and then they decide, no, we'll go up anyway. And he says in verse 42, and the Lord said unto me, say unto them, go not up, neither fight. So God's warning them, and it goes to show you again that how rebellious and stiff-necked they are. God says, don't do it. Oh, we're going to do it anyway. God says, go in the promised land. No. Okay, fine. Oh, no, we'll go. No, don't go. And then they go. It's just they're rebellious people. <coughs> and the Lord said to me, say to them, go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. So a good lesson there, you know, except Christ, you know, without, you know, except you abide in me, you can do nothing, as Jesus said, you know. We need to have the Lord to fight the Lord's battles, or we'll lose every time. And he says, uh, So I spake unto you, and you would not hear, but you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, our Lord your God, and went presumptuously up into the hill. And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you, and chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in, Mount, in Seir, even unto Hormah. So the same people, that just a few verses before, they're all fearful of, now they're willing to go fight. But the difference is, you know, that God isn't with them this time. God would have been with them, but they didn't believe that. And uh, they're, the only reason that they're acting like they're, they're going to do right now and go and fight is because they don't want to deal with the consequences. They're just trying to avoid the wilderness for 40 years or whatever. They don't want to deal with that. You know? and, and, you know, God doesn't want us to obey out of fear of punishment. You know, and that, if that's what it takes, fine, great, obey. But what it's showing us is that God wants us to obey because we love Him, because we believe Him, because we have faith, because we trust Him, because He's our Father, we're His children, and He's going to watch over us and care for us and protect us and fight our battles and help us. You know, they're, they're, that's not why they're going to fight the Amorites. It's, because they, it's not because they love God all of a sudden. It's because they don't want to deal with the consequences of their sin. They say, no, we don't want to end up in the wilderness. But, you know, God's saying, look, you've already shown me what you are. You've already proved to me what's in your heart, and I'm not going to fight your battles. You're going to deal with what, you know, you're going to, you, you got your coming ups coming, and you're going to deal with it. And he says, and the Amorites which dwelt them out came out against you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you in Seir and Hormah. And he returned and wept before the Lord your God, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. So you obey, abode in Kadesh many days according to the, the days that you abode there. So it does, the, the story of Israel is not necessarily a very cheerful one. And th but the fact is that he has to remind this generation of that so they don't repeat the same problem, they have the same instance. Because remember, they're, they're right there. 
The 40 years, it's almost to 41 years. The 40th year is coming to an end. God's going to keep his promise to bring him into the promised land. And he's reminding him, so remember the way your parents were when we got, up to, we got up to Jordan. We got to the Mount of the Amorites. Remember how they behaved in Kadesh Barnea. You know, we're right there. You know, don't do it again. And he's reminding them of this. And uh, really, the, the, the lesson to be learned here is to fear God and not men. That was their problem. They feared men more than God. They, they saw the Amorites, they saw the, the, the great walled cities and the chariots of iron. And instead of trusting in God and being afraid of what would happen if they didn't trust God, they feared man more. And the Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. You know, it will rob you, it will hold you back. A snare is like a trap. It will keep you in a certain place where you can't move and do the things that you would want to do. That's what the fear of man does, and that's exactly what we see here. here. That fear of man brought a snare to them, didn't it? It kept them trapped in the wilderness. They could not go over. They tried to go over, but they were chased out, you know, as if they were chased by bees, the Bible says. So the lesson really that we learn from that, this story is to fear God and not men. You know, if they had just trusted God, all would have been well. It would have been a totally different story. Right. If when those 12 spies came back, regardless of whatever report they had, good or bad, if they just said, well, you know what, the Lord is for it, with us. If they just listened to Joshua, if they just listened to Caleb, if they just recalled all the things that God had already done for them and, and been faithful and, and trusted in Him. I'm not saying not been you know, nervous or apprehensive, but just said, you know what? You know, we look at it, and humanly speaking, the odds are against us. It doesn't make any sense, but God's with us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And if they'd had that attitude, who knows? This could be a totally different story. But this is what happened. And, you know, the punishment might seem a little harsh. I mean, you guys, he says, look, none of you are going to go in. You're going to go out in the wilderness, and your carcasses are going to fall in the wilderness. You're going to go out and die. And it's going to take 40 years of just wandering around until you all die. You know, it wasn't 40 years, and then maybe you'll learn your lesson and go in. It was 40 years, and so, I'm, no, I'm not even going to, you know, you're going to have to die <laughs> before anyone else goes in. And, we, you know, I was thinking about it throughout the week. What an awkward circumstance that must have been for their kids. It's been like... <laughs> you know, what's taking so long? I'm getting real tired of this wilderness. And it's the, it's, it's the old man's fault, you know. And just like walking to your kid's bedroom, they just got a calendar they're marking. <laughs> what's that? Oh, nothing. You know, <laughs> just counting down to 40 years, you know. Or if you were that last guy, you know, that was alive in that generation, everyone's just kind of like, <laughs> you know. Every, t every time he walks out the door, there's just banana peels yeah. everywhere. <laughs> you know, and w we're always cutting the brakes on my chariot. You know, I don't know. <laughs> it was just a, s I don't know, just a thought that came to me. I was thinking about that, but, um, but it seems harsh, right? That punishment. Go out and die in the wilderness. Right. But you know what? Got you have to consider the fact of everything they saw leading up to that. Mm -hmm. That there really was no excuse. Yep. And and the Bible says, um, you know, whosoever much is given. Of much shall of him shall be required. They saw all the mighty works that God did in Egypt. They saw all those miracles. They were without excuse, and you know they should have gone in, but and they were punished accordingly because of everything they had seen. They were brought accountable, and that's what Moses is doing here in Deuteronomy one. He's making them accountable. He's saying, "Look, I'm starting at Horeb, and I'm going to remind you what was said there, because that's when your parents became accountable to God." When they saw all God's mighty works and they heard the laws and the statutes and the judgments of God and they saw, you know, the pillar of fire and everything and they still were faithless and believing, Moses is making this generation accountable by reminding of these things. And that's what he's going to do in the book of Deuteronomy. So stick with us throughout the upcoming months and we'll get through a great book in the Bible. Let's go ahead and pray.